Welcome to the Art of Precision on Gillette World Sport. Today we're in review mode as we rewind to the Winter and Summer X Games. Put Bayern Munich's Thomas Muller to the test. Ooh. And Usain Bolt on taking his final Olympic gold medal. The actual run through the line was, was magnificent. First up, we're in Kingston, Jamaica to relive the 4x100-meter final from last year's Rio Olympics with a man who needs no introduction. For nearly a decade, Usain Bolt has been the dominant force on the world sprinting stage. He became a household name after breakthrough success at the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games and maintained his winning streak with more medals at London 2012. By the time of his third Olympics, the world was expecting more. And true to form, Bolt once again delivered. After he took home the gold medal in the 200 meters and the 100 meters, he had one event remaining, which could take his Rio medal haul up to three, the four by 100 meter relay. In the year when he officially retired from the track, Bolt watched back this landmark moment with Gillette World Sport. Because it's an individual sport, all you do is run for yourself, by yourself, by yourself, and then the relay comes along, and all you guys are friends. So it's different now that you can actually hang out together because some of us compete against each other. So now you can hang out as a group, talk, laugh, warm up together. Now you know that he's fast, you're fast, it's going to be a strong team. You know you're going out there and the possibility of you winning are very high. It gives you that confidence to know that as long as I do my part, we're going to win. All right, coming out, we were deciding what we should do. It took us a while, but we decided that we were going to point. It's kind of cool though, it came out good. <laughs> I was a little bit nervous because you don't really have as much control over a relay because there's three other persons and anything could go wrong. So I was just trying to relax, deep breath, you know what I mean? But I also had faith in my teammates because they're the ones that always come true for me uh, year after year, so I know the possibility was there. Well, the start, I knew Asafa was a great starter. That's no question. So it was all about just getting the baton around. He started good. We were worried about the U.S. athlete, but he didn't catch him, which is <laughs> the good thing. Looking at the first baton change, it was smooth, which was good. Just watching, I was a little bit worried. I was wondering if Justin Gatlin would catch you on Blake, but I uh, didn't. He ran pretty well. The curve, I know Ashman is a 200-meter runner, so he, it wasn't going to be any issue. He was going to run good. All I wanted to do was just get the baton in my hands, and then I knew it wouldn't be over, you know what I mean? Actually, in the race, if you look at like 50 meters in, my hands hit the Japanese guy because we were both running so close to the line. And my hands hit his, and then I kind of looked over at him, if you watch the race closely. So that was, would have been a scare if I had the button had gone flying, then it wouldn't mean so good. The rest is just history. <laughs> For me, it was good. I was happy, I was proud. I know I'd done that tree, as you can see. I did the sign, that's number three, so it was good. And then I ran over to the people I knew in the crowd, and I was saying, you know, I'm the greatest. <laughs> so that's what was going on. It was all fun. I really enjoyed it. All I always go out there and say, listen to me, guys, please just get the baton around. <laughs> because we always have good team to run fast. It's not, never a question. I was like, as long as you guys get the baton to me, and they brought it in the pack, so it was easy for me. Actually, run through the line was, was magnificent. Uh, I was happy, I was like, yeah, history and been made, and I'm one of the greatest, so it was, it was a wonderful feeling. Next, we revisit Colorado, USA, for the best action from the four-day competition which made up the Aspen X Games 2017. 
Whether on snowboard, skis, snowmobiles or snow bikes, the show-stopping event attracts the world's finest athletes to compete and push the boundaries in their chosen disciplines and this year proved no exception. The Monster Energy Snowmobile Freestyle Final saw defending champion Joe Parsons landing a brand new trick, the vault body burial, to clinch the title. In the big air ski competition, Great Britain's James Woods needed a big score on his final jump. Coming in this time, going left side, triple court, 1440, a different <laughs> triple court. Which he managed, earning him gold. The snowboard superpipe final featured five former X Games gold medalists, but it was last year's bronze medalist, Australian Scotty James, whose first run bested the field by a full 10 points to take the superpipe title. Single front side, nine and away. The super fast super pipe proved to be so fast that only four of the 22 runs were completed in the ski final. And it was Aaron Blunk of the USA who topped the podium, earning big points for landing the first ever X Games super pipe back to back switch doubles. Double court 12, he sticks it. No way, Aaron Blunk! In the snowboard big air competition, Canada's Max Perot edged the goal by one point and landed a first in competition quadruple underflip. That was a quadruple underflip, folks. What? Another quadruple. In the ski superpipe, it was Norway's Oystein Braten who took his first gold medal in his fourth appearance of the Games. Triple court, 1440. Oh, he oh, gets oh. it. Perfect. And in snowboard slope style, Norwegian phenomenon, 17-year-old Marcus Cleveland stole the show, following up his big air silver with a gold run on slope style, punctuating the win with back-to-back -back triple corks. 91.66 for Marcus Cleveland. Time now for a look at some of the top social highlights from 2017. Heavyweight Anthony Joshua's hard training paid off as he defeated Vladimir Klitschko in front of 90,000 fans at Wembley Stadium. I had a good fight, I enjoyed it, but the main thing, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Norwegian snowboarder Marcus Cleveland showed off some of the skills that saw him win his first gold medal at this year's Winter X Games. Chris Froome tried out wake surfing before another hugely successful season on the bike, which saw him win both the Tour de France and the Vuelta a España. Ultra runner Killian Jornet continued to scale new heights as he shared this video of himself on an exposed ridge in Norway. James Harden's impressive ball control was just one of the reasons the Houston Rockets signed him to a $228 million new contract. While in the NBA Finals, Steph Curry and Kevin Durant led the Golden State Warriors to their second title in three years. Formula One champion Lewis Hamilton hit the slopes during the off-season. There was joy for two of football's biggest clubs as Arsenal won the FA Cup, while Manchester United were victorious in the final of the Europa League. And finally, Super Bowl fever gripped the sporting world with FC Barcelona trying out training with NFL balls whilst the game itself lived up to the hype, with the New England Patriots pulling off a stunning comeback win against the Atlanta Falcons. Next up, another chance to find out how well Bayern Munich's Thomas Muller remembers the precise details of his own career, after we've put him to the test with 10 crucial questions. I'm Thomas Muller, I'm 27, and my position is offensive midfield or striker, something in between. How many goals have you scored in total over two World Cup campaigns? Ten. Yeah, that's easy. It's in every newspaper, <laughs> every week. <laughs> in your first full Bundesliga season, Bayern Munich played 34 games. How many did you play in? 34. No. Oh, yes? 34. Woo! <laughs> Who were Germany playing when you scored your first international goal for the senior team? Australia. <laughs> Muller scored the third goal in the first game of Germany's 2010 World Cup campaign, winning Germany's Goal of the Month award in the process. 
On what date did you sign for the Bayern Munich youth system? What date for the youth system? Um, maybe it, uh, 2000, first, first July 2000. On March the 9th, 2017, who did you call a fantastic player and a great person on Twitter? Dirk Nowitzki. Ah, okay. Muller tweeted Bayern Munich teammate Zabi Alonso after the midfielder announced he would retire at the end of the current season. In total, how many minutes did you play during the 2014 World Cup? 658. <sighs> At the 2010 World Cup, you won the Golden Boot. Who won the same award in the previous World Cup in 2006? Miroslav Klose. Yeah? Cool. In 2015, you became the youngest player to win 50 Champion League games. Whose record did you break? Raul. Muller racked up his 50th Champions League win at the age of 26 years, 2 months, and 11 days. The previous holder of the record was Spanish legend Raul, who notched up his 50 wins at the age of 26 years, 8 months, and 12 days, a full 6 months older than Muller. What comments did you make with this Instagram pic? I don't know. I don't know yet. <laughs> but, uh, of course, a funny, uh, a funny post. <laughs> The post from the 1st of January actually said all the best for 2017. Who were Bayern Munich playing when you scored your 150th goal for the club? Against Werder Bremen. <laughs> yes, correct. <laughs> that final lucky guess gave Muller 7 out of 10. Another strong performance from the record-breaking forward. Still to come, we rewind to the Summer X Games in Minneapolis and revisit UFC fighter Gunnar Nelson in Iceland. Welcome back to Gillette World Sport. Coming up, another chance to master MMA with Gunnar Nelson. And a roundup of a dramatic year in World Superbikes. Now we drop in for all the best tricks at the Summer X Games in the USA. X Games kicked off the first of four days in its new summer home of Minneapolis with the Skateboard Vert event, where last year's silver medalist Moto Shibata of Japan earned 90 points from the judges for this winning run. Over in the BMX Vert, Australian Vince Byron went into his final run in second place, but an incredible ride secured him the top spot. 32,000 fans took their seats in the stadium as the action moved indoors on Friday. The USA's Garrett Reynolds kicked things off in the evening, winning a gold medal in the BMX Street Finals for the ninth time. But it was his fellow countryman James Foster who stole the show in the BMX Big Air. Oh boy, good landing. A backflip triple tail whip followed by a bar spin to triple downside whip earned him his first X Games gold medal. The night was capped off with New Zealand's Levi Sherwood laying down three double backflip variations in freestyle motocross to ride away with his first X Games goal. On Saturday, motocross step up defending gold medalist Jared McNeil won gold when he cleared the bar at 44 feet. No problem. In Saturday's skateboard competitions, rookie rider Brazilian Calvin Huffler came out of nowhere to take home his first ever X Games medal, winning gold in Skateboard Street. Oh! Hit the front side flip. Whilst in the Skateboard Big Air, veteran X Games medalist Elliot Sloan won a ninth X Games medal with his fourth run. 
The USA's Kevin Parazza scored 90.33 to take the win in BMX Park. Whilst on the final day of competition, X Games rookie Colton Walker, who grew up just outside of Minneapolis, stunned the crowd to bag gold in BMX dirt. Into the oh, it went to the horseman. That is a huge, huge saving right there by Colton Walker, the local boy. And in the final event of the weekend, the motocross quarter pipe high air, X Games rookie Colby Raha of the USA took home gold to round off the four days of competition. Next, another chance to master mixed martial arts in our exclusive guide with Icelandic UFC fighter Gunnar Nelson. Fighting is funny, you know, it's in a way the best way to get to know somebody. My plan has always been the same. It's becoming the best I can be. The way I train and my ambition will get me to the very highest level. I do believe that I will hold the UFC belt in the near future. When I was 17 or 18, I went to uh, Dublin to train with uh, my coach today, John Kavanagh. He has a big team there, including Conor McGregor. And then 2012, I got into the UFC. John has had a lot of influence on me because he's a small guy. Uh, I think that's a big part of my success that I adopted a small guy style and I'm a, a little bit bigger than him, but I'm, I'm also able to beat bigger opponents. Training with Connor is great. Back in the day, we had like pretty much opposite styles. I kind of brought karate into his game and he taught me a lot of the boxing. We're gonna continue training together unless he goes full-time boxing. <laughs> karate gives you a lot of feel for distance. There's a lot of emphasis on speed, time your shots, hit that first shot, hit that counter. And there's, uh, there's not many guys who know that kind of style in MMA today. Boxing, kickboxing, Thai boxing is a lot more common. I don't go in there swinging for the fences. I go in there and, and, and calculate my opponent and land these strikes or else get him down and then finish him. When I started fighting, I, I thought to myself that the most practical way to beat somebody was to take them down. When you're on your feet, you might get a little angle, get a couple of strikes in, but then you're back squared up. But when you get a, somebody down and you get a position on them, that's positional dominance and you can keep it that way. Once you get somebody to the ground, the key is to keep the weight on them, you know, in the right place, you know, because they'll be trying to move, trying to stand up, trying to push you away. So your weight placement is very important. You need to be like a, a bag of sand. I just, whatever you push, it just kind of leaks the other way and you just cannot get that thing off you. It's not just about holding with your hands, it's about using your, your arms, your hips, your legs, your chest, your whole stomach, everything, your head. You gotta use everything to keep somebody in, in place and slowly working them, you know, like a, like a snake, like an anaconda. And then finally, you get that chokehold, you get that submission. That's a very uh, practical and clinical way to fight and to finish a fight, I think. It's a beautiful feeling, you know, when you, when you win your fight. It feels like almost you're in a war or something, you won a war. I have respect for my opponents and anyone who goes in there, you know, it's not an easy task. And after the fight, obviously, if you've created a little bit of a bond, if you had some trash talk before, you've seen it many times, people usually hug, and I think that's a beautiful thing. I don't really focus too much on titles or, or medals. I want to become as good as I can. I want to master this art. That's my goal, you know, and, and you can never. So it's, it's a journey that you're always on, and I'm loving it. Finally this week, a chance to relive how this year's World Superbikes crown was won as we rewind to the start of the year. 
The curtain opener of the 2017 season took place at Phillip Island, the motorcycling capital of Australia, and all eyes were on reigning two-time champion Kawasaki Racing Team's Jonathan Ray. The 30-year-old Irishman claimed the first two wins of the opening weekend, sending a clear message that he was the rider to beat as he aimed for a third consecutive title. Ray remained in superb form over the first four rounds, and by round five in Italy, he was leading his nearest rival Tom Sykes by 64 points in the overall standings. Third place, Chaz Davies took back-to-back -back victories in Imola, moving him to second in the standings, but second place finishes for championship leader Ray meant he increased his lead to 74. Davies, desperate to claw back some of Ray's advantage, surged into the lead in round six, but disaster struck for the Ducati leaders. He crashed out on lap seven. With six laps to go, Tom Sykes powered away from second place Ray, but the drama wasn't over yet due to a sudden deflation of Ray's tyre. Race two, however, saw the Irishman make amends, finishing 1.6 seconds ahead of Sykes to claim Kawasaki's 100th win. A tight battle for first place in round seven ended in a disastrous final lap for Davies and Ray. Oh, Davies goes down and he's hit by Jonathan Ray. They both go down at turn 14. Davies was later diagnosed with a fractured vertebrae and ruled out for race two. Whilst Ray managed to remount his bike and finish in third with a double podium weekend, maintaining his dominance overall. Barely three weeks after the crash, Davies was back on his bike to win the opening race of the USA round, but Ray responded by topping the podium in race two. Even a double win for Davies in Germany couldn't close the gap at the top of the standings. And by round 10, Jonathan Ray had a 70-point lead. Teammate Tom Sykes' challenge for the title came to a halt before official racing even began in Portugal, with a tough crash during free practice ruling him out of both races. He would make a full and fast recovery, but the subsequent racing was dominated by Ray, with two wins extending his lead to 120 points. Which meant all he needed to do was win the first race at round 11 in France to be crowned 2017 World Superbike Champion, something he did in style, finishing 16.3 seconds ahead of the rest of the field. With his 50th Superbikes race win, Ray became the first rider ever to win three back-to-back -back Superbike World Championships.